Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, before we start the meeting, please notice that an online evaluation is available through the chat. We will be most thankful if you can complete the evaluation shortly after the meeting. I would now like to invite the moderator, Mr. Hamza Malik, Director of the Macroeconomic Policy and Financing for Development Division of SCAP to start the meeting. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, good morning and a warm welcome from Bangkok to SCAP's regional conversation on financing sustainable development and addressing debt risks in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have an excellent and distinguished list of speakers to enlighten us, uh, enlighten us on this very important topic today. We will start with a question for each speaker, then open the floor to take questions from participants, and then time permitting, we may come back to our speakers to share their final thoughts and key messages. So let's get straight to it. It is my pleasure to invite Ms. Amida Salsia Alis Jabana, Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of ASCAP, to deliver her welcoming remarks. Ivo Amida, you have the floors. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hamza. A very good morning, good afternoon. Uh, Excellency Mr. Mark Brown, Prime Minister of Cook Islands. Excellency Mr. Carlos Dominguez, Secretary of Finance of the Philippines. Excellency Mr. Ibrahim Amir, Minister of Finance Maldives. Excellency Mr. Ajit Cabral, Governor of Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Excellency Mr. Henry Puna, Secretary General of the PIFs. Excellencies, distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our regional conversation on financing sustainable development and addressing debt risk in the aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic. Potential of innovative sustainable financing strategies. This is the second event of our 2021 regional conversation series. These regional conversation focus on priority areas where SCAP can support member states in their post-COVID-19 recovery efforts and their journey towards SDGs. The COVID-19 pandemic caused much damage in terms of lives and livelihoods loss. It has exacerbated challenges to finance SDGs as the resources have been channeled to support recovery efforts. Several developing economies in Asia and Pacific are experiencing constrained fiscal space and rising debt levels in a context where the recovery from COVID-19 pandemic remains uncertain and uneven. As a result, policymakers are now faced with a very difficult task. How to, how to ensure a sustained socioeconomic recovery, which will require continued fiscal support while finding the means to finance the rising fiscal deficit and tackle debt sustainability concerns. At the same time, policymakers are keenly aware that we are only less than nine years away from 2030 and the Asia Pacific region is behind in its path towards achieving all of the sustainable development goals. Without adequate financing for the needed investment, the likelihood of achieving these goals looks even more distant. Distinguished participants, in 2020 and 2021, a major financial crisis was avoided because of timely, proactive, and innovative policy interventions by several countries, supported by abundant emergency lending by the international financial institutions and the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative, or DSSI. Going forward with the DSSI ending this year and the recovery from the pandemic remaining uncertain, continued policy support and the use of innovative financing instrument will be critical. However, it will not be easy. As fiscal deficit and debt levels rise and financing them becomes more demanding. Such challenges may increase further in 2022 if the current spike in inflation due to incipient economic recovery and constraints in global supply chain 
becomes entrenched and requires central banks to increase interest rates. Similarly, as countries prioritize a speedy economic recovery, there is a risk that less attention will be paid to tackling climate change. Indeed, early assessment, as highlighted in the 2021 edition of SCAP's flagship report, the Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific, reveals that the significant policy packages rolled out by governments may have missed the opportunity to promote low carbon, climate resilient, and green development pathways. Within this policy panorama, common to all countries globally, the purpose of this regional conversation is to turn the focus to Asia, Pacific, to Asia and the Pacific. We want to learn what measures countries have taken to deal with the situation. How do they intend to manage their vulnerabilities while continuing to finance needed investment in sustainable development? What innovative financing instruments and strategies are being used in this regard to close the financing gap? One example of a mechanism that can simultaneously address debt and climate risk is debt or climate swap. It will be very important to learn about the potential for scaling up this mechanism in the region as a tool to reduce debt risk and increase investment in climate action. To address these and other important questions, we are very privileged today that high-level policymakers and distinguished experts have joined our conversation on financing sustainable development. I very much look forward to your insights and suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yulmida, for setting the stage for our exciting conversation today. Um, let me now introduce the full list of uh, distinguished panelists today. We are honored to have with us his Excellency, Mr. Mark Brown, the Prime Minister of Cook Islands, who is also the country's Minister of Finance. We are also honored to have with us His Excellency, Mr. Carlos Dominguez III, the Secretary of Finance of the Philippines, who will deliver his remarks through a recorded message. And His Excellency, Mr. Ibrahim Amir, the Minister of Finance of Maldives. We are also delighted to have his Excellency Mr. Ajit Nevrad Cabral, the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. We also have the pleasure to have with us today Mr. Henry Puna, the Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum, which is a key partner of ASCAP in the Pacific. The list of other distinguished experts includes Mr. Amar Bhattacharya, a Senior Fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development, which is a part of the global economy and development program at Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., United States of America. Mr. Pekka Morin, Special Representative of the Finance Minister on Climate Action at the Finance Ministry of Finland. Mr. Jeromin Zettelmeyer, Deputy Director at the Strategy, Policy and Review Department of the International Monetary Fund. Mr. Asanali Dusembe, Director of the State Borrowing Department at the Ministry of Finance of Kazakhstan. And last but not least, Mr. Eric Grigorian, who's an expert on environmental economics and a former Minister of Environment of Armenia. Dear panelists, before starting, I would request that you kindly limit your initial interventions to around five minutes, which will allow us to have some time for follow-up questions and take questions from the floor as well. Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, let me now turn to our first distinguished speaker, His Excellency Mr. Mark Brown, to start the conversation. Excellency, the Cook Islands, like other small island developing states in the Pacific, faces major climate risks which require substantial investments in climate adaptation. At the same time, many Pacific small island developing states are facing a high risk of debt distress, according to the debt sustainability analysis of IMF and World Bank. Do you see the debt for climate swaps as a potential solution to address both climate and debt risk simultaneously? And what are the main considerations that are needed by the Pacific small island developing states to successfully implement such a solution. 
Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to uh, our distinguished guests that are part of the program. I'd like to uh, firstly pass on a very warm greetings from the Cook Islands. Um, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this discussion. I think um, for the Cook Islands, Pacific Island countries, uh, they, the COVID situation has exacerbated the debt situation that we are all in. Uh, contraction of our economy has meant that government revenues have declined uh, and our debt position has increased dramatically. The debt for climate swaps as an instrument to assist in managing debt, I think is a good concept for those countries who have something to swap in terms of high levels of carbon emissions that they need to mitigate against or uh, adaptation measures that can be uh, monetized, if you like, and used as part of the debt for climate swap. However, for microeconomies like ours, our contribution to carbon emissions is minuscule. So the value uh, that we would place, but just by virtue of our small size, uh, would not have as much impact in a debt for climate swap as it would for much larger countries. And in terms of nature-based adaptation measures, again, uh, by their very application, they do not address the immediate adaptation needs of uh, small island developing states like ours. Uh, for our countries, the need to build resilience means right now at this moment we are building stream banks so that water does not overflow and reach homes that are being flooded for the first time in our history. It means building larger water storage capacity on our remote islands for islands that are experiencing levels of drought never before again, experienced in our history. Uh, so for us, the focus uh, that we are looking at, and I guess an innovative way that we are looking at managing our debt, which is growing, is to put the focus onto debt servicing and the amount of money that each country needs to apply to debt servicing. And I think if there was to be support for countries to manage their debt situation, it is to look at some sort of financial instrument that countries can use to service not only existing debt, but to be able to take on debt uh, from our traditional uh, uh, traditional lenders, knowing that the debt servicing component can be managed, can be discounted or can be covered for a period of time that it will take for our economies to recover, to recover from uh, the current COVID crisis that we have, uh, but also to allow us time to build resilience for the coming and the existing climate uh, um, extremes that we are uh, experiencing right now. Uh, so my, my focus is looking at the innovation in terms of debt management by focusing efforts on debt servicing, looking at ways that we can take debt that is considered adaptation or, or climate debt on our books, on our national accounts, and setting them aside again with the assistance of global entities like the, the IMF and other major financial institutions, can we recognize small island developing states debt on a separate ledger so that it's not recognized on our national accounts and allows countries like us to be able to engage in debt arrangements without the distress levels that have been caused by our need to take out debt, firstly for uh, building climate resilience, but more immediately now uh, for surviving this COVID situation that we are in. Do we need debt instruments now that reflect the long-term nature of climate impacts rather than debt that is traditionally under banking terms of 10 to 20 years? Do we need to be able to take out debt at much, much more extended periods of amortization of 50 to 100 years at 0% interest? These are some of the things I think that uh, financial institutions need to consider and need to look at as solutions to help countries try to act as normal as possible under very severe uh, debt distress situations. Um, so those are my initial thoughts on, on, on those uh, questions that have been raised. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Uh, very insightful observations, very clear, very direct in terms of future directions that you intend to take in your country and your broader recommendations. While paying attention to debt servicing, there will be a need for countries to continue to support them. And then in the process, of course, there will be need to accumulate debt and how to do that over longer term maturities. Thank you, Excellency, once again. We are now going to see a recorded video message by His Excellency Carlos Dominguez III, the Secretary of Finance of the Philippines, which is essentially based on this question. Philippines, like other developing countries in the region, has faced the challenge of financing additional public expenditures to address the health and socioeconomic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Going forward, in addition to recovery efforts, additional financial resources will be required for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and fulfill the commitments of the Paris Agreement. It can be a difficult task to meet such considerable financing requirements. Yet, innovative financing options can support countries in raising the required financing and attracting investments needed. How does the Philippines plan to manage the financing needs and what innovative financing solutions is your, country, is your country considering? For instance, green bonds, climate bonds, and so on and so forth. Let's play the video message. Thank you for this opportunity to share the Philippines' experience in fighting this pandemic. The pandemic confronted almost all countries with complex challenges. For most governments, one salient challenge is how to muster enough resources to effectively fight the virus while at the same time keeping fiscal deficits at sustainable levels. Fortunately, the Philippines was financially ready when the pandemic hit us. We entered 2020 with a historic low debt to GDP ratio of 39.6%. At the same time, we had raised our revenue effort to a two-decade high of 16.1% of GDP. The government fiscal deficit was kept at about 3% of GDP. The years of fiscal discipline and pursuit of the most comprehensive tax reform in our recent history brought us to this strong fiscal position. This, in turn, earned us the highest credit ratings we have ever achieved. Because of all the unplanned spending for COVID-19 response and the drop in our revenues due to our lockdowns, we had to deal with the temporary but controlled expansion of our deficit to GDP ratio of 7.6% last year. But we had set out a clear strategy for financing our deficit. We prioritized domestic borrowings, followed by official development assistance, and the international capital markets. We determined this plan as the most prudent approach, ensuring sustainability in our debt service. With our high credit ratings affirmed amid the wave of downgrades globally, we were able to source emergency financing expeditiously and at very good rates and terms. Although our debt to GDP ratio rose to about 54.6% last year, this remains eminently manageable considering our excellent record of prudent spending and fiscal discipline. Our economic stimulus measures were among the largest this country has had. However, we took into account what the country can spend quickly and effectively. Instead of throwing money at the crisis, the government adopted the more prudent strategy of expanding lending to pandemic hit enterprises by adding more capital to our government banks. Instead of passing funds through what tend to be less efficient government programs, we are leaving money in the private sector's hands to revitalize their businesses through a hefty reduction in corporate income tax rates. We are confident that the elevated debt and deficit level is a temporary condition and we can quickly return to fiscal consolidation. 
In fact, through the first three quarters of this year, our tax collections were already 9% above last year's level. Aside from decisively addressing the pandemic, we have also intensified our climate change actions. Earlier this year, we set a bold and ambitious target of 75% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Achieving our ambitious goal requires a comprehensive whole of nation approach. Our private sector increased its efforts in promoting green, social, and sustainability bonds to help finance their more sustainable investments. The government, for its part, has been crafting a framework of policies to support sustainable development. We recently launched our Sustainable Finance Roadmap, which sets the guiding principles that will create the environment for greener policies, the mainstreaming of sustainable finance, and a pipeline of investments that will help us reduce our carbon footprint. We are also exploring a financing mechanism to enable the government to improve the generating capacity of the hydropower plant in Mindanao, one of our major island groups. As we increase the generating capacity of that hydropower plant, we will acquire coal-powered plants in the island to repurpose them. Through the Philippine Crop Insurance Corporation, the government is expanding assets and crops to give farmers adequate protection from crop losses and reinforce risk mitigation and resilience efforts in the agriculture sector. We are also pushing for the passage of a bill banning single-use plastics to end marine pollution. More importantly, we are now moving from merely delving on theories to actually implementing practical and achievable solutions on the ground to address climate change. We have put together a new group of brilliant Filipino experts who represent all corners of the archipelago to engage local communities in climate change mitigation and adaptation. In the upcoming COP26 meeting, we will strongly call on the developed economies which contributed and continue to contribute more to greenhouse gas emissions to abide by their commitment to delivering urgent financing to climate vulnerable countries. The fight to save the planet can only succeed if all nations act in concert and actively reduce emissions in a just and equitable manner. Thank you. dependent on tourism, the impact on Maldives has been significant. What is the current economic and fiscal situation in your country? And what is the government doing to ensure fiscal and debt sustainability? The floor is yours, Excellency. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Bismillah rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, as you have uh, rightly highlighted, uh, Maldives being a small uh, country very much reliant on tourism, uh, our uh, travel industry was uh, really hit hard. Uh, next year, we are uh, uh, actually uh, uh, having the 50th anniversary of our uh, travel uh, tourism industry. We started in around 1973. And for the first time in uh, 50 years, uh, we didn't have tourists in our islands. Uh, we closed the, our uh, international borders, all the resorts were closed. And so you can imagine the economic uh, pain that would have uh, affected our uh, economy. 
In 2019, we had around 1.8 million tourists. And initially for 2020, we were forecasting around uh, 2 million tourists uh, to the Maldives. And uh, But uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, because of the lockdowns and uh, close down of our international borders, we managed to get around uh, 400,000 uh, tourists for uh, 2020. So that was a market decline in our tourist arrival numbers, around 65 to 70 percent decline compared to 2019. But we opened our borders in July 15th, uh, and I think that is the biggest stimulus to our economy. And uh, in 2020, in 2021, what we are seeing is that initially we forecasted to get around 600,000 tourists, uh, but we revised the numbers uh, to around 1 million tourists, and now we are again revising the tourist arrival numbers to 1.3 million. Uh, we have had uh, a very successful vaccination program compared to the rest of the world. Uh, we uh, currently, uh, we are very much uh, uh, close to the pre-COVID levels. In 2019, our uh, tourist average tourist arrival number was around 4,600 per day. And right now we have more than 4,600 tourist arrival numbers. So all our resorts are actually now uh, being operated very much uh, or very close to the full capacity. Uh, in 2020, the economy declined by around 33.5% uh, in real terms uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the result in restrictions. Uh, this was the largest contraction of our economy in modern history. Uh, however, we were uh, solidly on. Uh, we are solidly on the path to recovery. Uh, we expect real GDP to grow by 31.6% in 2021. Uh, despite the uh, point estimates uh, being different, uh, the IMF uh, uh, estimates it will be at 18%, and the World Bank estimates it will be at uh, 22%. Uh, we have also upgraded the GDP growth outlook for Maldives for 2021 to 32%. Uh, we believe these, under, uh, these underestimates, uh, the positive developments we have seen over the past uh, few months in the tourism sector, uh, in the econ economic activity in general. Even with the relatively underestimated growth forecast for 2021 by IMF, they anticipate that Maldives will be the country to achieve the fifth, uh, fifth highest growth rate globally. And our nominal GDP is expected to return to the pre-COVID levels by 2022 in our uh, moderate case. If you, when, you, when we look at the fiscal situation, uh, fiscal policy for 2022 to 2024, uh, our medium-term fiscal strategy will focus on improving the fiscal and debt position worsened by the COVID-19 crisis on, and on improving the debt sustainability. Uh, what we are seeing is right now the actual performance uh, on the ground is better than our uh, forecasted revenue. So, uh, and looking at the increase in debt to GDP in 2020, uh, which was primarily driven, driven by the large decline in our nominal GDP. Uh, the fiscal deficit has also worsened in 2020, despite the extensive expenditure reduction measures, uh, which led to increase in debt levels. Uh, the widening of the deficit was almost entirely uh, due to the large decline in revenue. Only 50% of the revenue was realized uh, during that year, uh, compared to the budgeted levels. Uh, the overall balance as a percentage of GDP is expected to be around 16.1% of GDP in 2021, and the primary deficit is to, uh, to GDP will be around 12.4%. As the economy is expected to recover over the medium term, uh, we believe the debt to GDP ratio will reduce gradually. Uh, just to, uh, before I conclude, uh, uh, in looking at the uh, ensuring fiscal and debt sustainability, what are the measures that we are going to take? Actually, we have uh, published our fiscal risk uh, statement and also the fiscal uh, strategy, medium term fiscal strategy, which will have fiscal anchors. And our target is to achieve less than 100% uh, 
uh, debt to GDP numbers by 2023 and have uh, less than uh, overall uh, deficit uh, 5% by 2023. Uh, we have uh, very recently issued a $500 million sukuk this year to meet our financing needs. Uh, while the interest rate was higher than what we what we were enjoying pre-COVID uh, with almost all countries, uh, we received overwhelming support uh, for the issuance. And for our last TEP issuance of $200 million, our offer was oversubscribed by threefold. Uh, and I believe this is the evidence uh, that the markets and investors have confidence in our recovery and policies to maintain sustainability during these challenges and times. Uh, and uh, despite these challenges, uh, our debt portfolio is still strong. Uh, most notably, uh, uh, about 90% of the external debt portfolio is concessional or close to concessional. And the average interest rate of our external debt portfolio is uh, around 4%, including the recently issued uh, Sukuk. Uh, so I believe as the economy recovers and the government revenue recovers, uh, we, we are very confident in making steady progress with regard to our fiscal and debt matters. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Excellency. Um, very happy to note, very glad to learn that Maldives is on its way for full recovery after a very devastating year 2020. Uh, the GDP growth is on track to pick up, which will benefit both the revenue side and the debt sustainability over time. And congratulations again on oversubscribed issuance of Sukuks. Um, so wish you all the best in consolidating these initial gains further. Our next uh, panelist is His Excellency Mr. Ajit Nivrad Cabral, the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Governor Cabral, similar to Maldives, Sri Lanka has also been hit hard by the collapse of the tourism and travel industry. But the problem has been compounded um, due to the downgrades in Sri Lanka's sovereign credit rating by several rating agencies. Without access to international capital markets and no eligibility to the debt service suspension initiative of the G20 or its common framework for debt treatments, what are the options for Sri Lanka to deal with the situation? What options are there for Sri Lanka to obtain additional financing through bilateral creditors or emergency finance by international finance institutions? And what are the pros and cons of entering restructuring negotiations with private bondholders? The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say I'm happy to join this regional conversation and uh, I think it's a very useful topic to dwell upon as well. Uh, you asked me about the downgrades. I think many countries have been downgraded during the recent past uh, in the face of the pandemic. I believe some of those may have been somewhat, <clears throat> somewhat uh, insensitive because when you really look at the countries that have been downgraded, nearly uh, more than 100 countries, it appears to be somewhat strange that these have been uh, downgraded at a time when the global pandemic is creating the chaos and that itself is causing the vulnerabilities. So you add further vulnerabilities into countries by downgrading and providing no access to finance. I think that's uh, a very, very difficult question to deal with. The second part is you mentioned very clearly, uh, Mr. Hamza, where you said without access to capital markets uh, and no eligibility to debt service suspension, how do you manage? It's like telling a person, well, you are in trouble. I'm not going to help you. So how do you manage? I think that's uh, also insensitive from the point of view of the global community. You're telling people you are in trouble, but uh, I'm not go going to be there to help you. Every country help their businessmen, their people, by providing debt moratoriums, by providing support, by providing low cost loans. The reverse happened internationally. And we don't seem to be uh, any, uh, we, we don't seem to be shameful of that as well. The IMF brought about their new SDR one year and six months late, too late. The pandemic occurred in March, 2020. There were several people, including myself, who said it's time 
for the IMF to provide a special drawing right immediately so that countries don't get downgraded. But they did it only in August 2021, well after all the, the problems have occurred in those countries. So it was really too little, too late, because most countries went through that pain. And thereafter, you provide them with a lifeline, which at that stage becomes quite meaningless. So I think the global community must realize that certain actions need to be taken at the time that it should be taken, not much later after so much deliberation that it has really no meaning. Well, Sri Lanka has developed certain options in the face of all these difficulties. We have decided that we should reduce our uh, market debt in any case. So we are moving towards that. We are moving towards G2G kind of um, new additional financing. You mentioned that. I think that's an excellent way to move forward. And we are talking to several uh, uh, countries uh, which are reserve rich so that we can have additional support. And at the same time, the central bank is looking at certain swaps and that again is very helpful. We also think that it's time now to take certain steps to have non-debt inflows coming into the country so that we are not being burdened by too much debt. So that's why we identified several assets which were underutilized. Those are now being monetized. And I think that's also going to be a very important part of our overall debt management strategy going forward. So I believe some good came out of it because uh, countries like us, we changed the way that we are operating so that we re reduce our reliance upon debt. And that's, I think, going to be very helpful. One last point, you asked about the pain, uh, the, the pros and cons of entering into restructuring arrangements. I think that's a very, very sensitive question as well because we all know restructuring entails great pain to creditors. It also entails great pain to the countries that are entering into restructuring arrangements. So that should be the last option, not the first option. So countries must see how best are we going to work out our way in which we are going to deal with the debt. And I think that's a very important part of overall debt management as well. We know that when you enter into a restructuring arrangement, many other uh, factors kick in, and that can sometimes be very unhelpful to a country in going forward, especially at a time when you need to have all your options open in order to go forward. So Sri Lanka has no such uh, intention. We believe that we are on top of the situation to deal with the debt. And I think any country, if it does need any restructuring arrangement, Others, especially international organizations, must ensure that there is a debt standstill, not only for the one or two countries that are appearing to have difficulties, but to all countries, especially the market uh, uh, access uh, denied countries, uh, so that they could also have a debt standstill for a reasonable period of time, just like we had for many businessmen as well as countries. So I think it's an important factor for us to consider, uh, perhaps um, uh, overall, as to how countries in general could be provided with the space to deal with the pandemic as well as fallout. And I think if this discussion, this regional conversation could escalate something of that nature, that could be very helpful as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Governor Cabral, for these very, very candid views. Uh, as an economist and an ex-central banker myself, I certainly can agree, actually, I can see your point and agree on the insensitivity of credit rating agencies in particular. Uh, it's a global common shock, nobody's fault. However, because of the revisions in rating agencies, uh, credit rating agencies, it has actually has adversely affected the ability of countries to go to the market and try and support their economies. So point extremely well taken. Also. Thanks for highlighting the timing of certain initiatives is actually very critical, referring to uh, IMF's SDR issuance and of some of the suggestions on debt standards and so on and so forth. So really thank you very much for these very valuable uh, observations and contributions. Uh, let's continue our conversation. Um, our next panelist is Mr. Henry Puna, the Secretary General of Pacific Island Forum. Mr. Puna, at the latest Forum of Economic Ministers meeting, FEMM, in July 2021, 
the Pacific Economic Ministers endorsed the convening of a regional debt conference between the Forum Island countries and their creditors to discuss and explore options for debt relief. Additionally, the FEMM established the Pacific Resilience Facility, a regional mechanism for financing climate change adaptation and mitigation. These are two important initiatives taken to solve debt distress challenges and mobilize financing towards climate action. Can you expand a little bit on FEMM's vision for these initiatives going forward and what would be considered a success? The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, moderator. This cap executive secretary, Ms. Amida Ali Shabana, Prime Minister Mark Brown, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. And warm greetings from the Blue Pacific. At the outset, let me thank the organizers for the invitation to participate at this important regional conversation. I wish to use this opportunity to share our collective efforts to address the region's development financing needs and deal with the debt situation faced by Pacific small island developing states. PCs currently face the triple threat of health and economic crisis due to COVID-19 and climate change induced disasters that have become more frequent and more severe in our region. These challenges are in addition to the ongoing development financing needs of PCIDS. I will now address the issue of Pacific debt risks. Almost all PCIDS face long-standing debt challenges. This is exacerbated by declining revenues and increasing expenditure in the region. Many PCIDS have increased borrowing to address our current challenges leading to most countries experiencing a higher risk of debt distress. According to the World Bank, in 2020, 13 PCIDS are classified as at high risk of debt distress. This is a significant jump from sixth in 2019. A quick estimate of capital debt in the region shows that every man, woman, and child is carrying U.S. $1,400 of the region's debt. Now we need to explore ways to address the debt situation now, rather than wait until the situation worsens. In view of this, Forum Economic Ministers at their meeting in July endorsed the convening of a regional debt conference between PCIDS and their creditors to explore innovative options for debt relief. It is extremely important that creditors and debtors gather around the table with an open mind to support one another, because the truth is we're all in this together. Creditors need to support debtors to enable them to continue to service their debts without risking the welfare of their people or at the expense of other development priorities. We expect the debt conference to come up with a win-win situation for both debtors and creditors, and hope all creditors will be at the table. At this point, I'd like to thank SCAP for agreeing to co-host the debt conference in March next year. This will greatly benefit PCIDS in their efforts to manage their debts at sustainable levels. Let me now speak briefly to the Pacific Resilience Facility. The innovative Pacific Resilience Facility is a regional development financing initiative endorsed by Pacific Island Forum leaders and Forum Economic Ministers to provide small grants to community resilience projects against climate change and disaster risks. The PRF is our homegrown solution against the more regular and severe climate change related and other disasters that hit our region every year. PRF is based on the principles of regional ownership, affordable and contextualized financing 
and investment in disaster preparedness. We know for a fact that for every U.S. $1 spent on disaster preparedness, saves U.S. $7 in recovery costs after every disaster. To date, we are soliciting financial support and commitments from our development partners to capitalize the PRF, which will culminate at a global pledging event to be convened later next year. We hope our development partners will invest in our Pacific-owned and Pacific-led resilience facility. And in conclusion, once again, let me thank UNESCAP for the opportunity to participate in this important conversation. And I look forward to the outcomes of this event and further collaboration with ESCAP in these matters for the benefit of our people in the Blue Pacific. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Puna. Thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to working with Pacific Island Forum in supporting uh, the forthcoming debt conference and other and working with other small island Pacific developing countries. Um, our next panelist now is um, Mr. Pekka Moran, Special Representative of the Finance Minister on Climate Action at the, Min, uh, at the Finance Ministry of Finland. So let's change gears a little bit, uh, moving away from debt uh, and fiscal pressure conversation that we have so far. Mr. Moran, your country, along with Chile, has played a leadership role in the establishment of the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action in April 2019. Since its launch, finance ministers from over 60 countries have signed on to the Helsinki Principles which proposed to align fiscal policies and the use of public finance with the Paris Agreement commitments. <clears throat> How can governments in Asia and the Pacific achieve such alignment given their limited fiscal space? What financing mechanisms and policies should be considered in your opinion? Mr. Morin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I would like to introduce, uh, start by uh, telling a few words about the Coalition of Finance Ministers. We are today 65 members, uh, Finland is co-chairing with Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia came in last spring. We have 25 institutional partners uh, acting broadly in our member countries and uh, the Secretariat functions now up and running with the World Bank and the IMF. So it's a big ecosystem of actors uh, working together to achieve uh, these goals. And our mission is incorporating climate related risks into the economic and financial planning. This is the main objective of the coalition. And the Helsinki Principles is our strategic basis. But turning to the key question of today about the fiscal space, and about how to adjust policies to that. Issue about uh, challenges in the context of the COVID crisis and the fis uh, in uh, fiscal uh, challenges is a general problem. This has become clear also in the discussions of the coalition. Limited fiscal space dominates the discussion in all regions and countries. How to combine this with the huge investment needs to address the climate change at the same time. But luckily the message is that there is a strong appetite for reforms. And as we've heard today, even if there are country specific challenges, there are really good uh, strategies on how to uh, get around this problem. We heard uh, those examples also today. So there is a need to develop transition strategies, plans to adopt and plans to decarbonize. This has been, uh, of course, the key area of discussion uh, in, in the coalition. But how do we achieve this? There are really the few key uh, points to that end. First, we need to understand exactly the nature of risks that climate change poses to our public finances and economies. Second, we need to develop frameworks, practices and tools on how to manage these risks. 
The countries with adaptation issues, of course, are developing contingency plans together with their partners. So we need tools to analyze these impacts. Also impacts of reforms. Finance ministries are needed uh, to really develop those uh, impact assessments. We need to develop the financial markets. This is one key area of work of the coalition. Transparency, disclosure, of course, financial instruments and specific special vehicles, uh, institutions that may support uh, 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 transition. Blended finance instruments, green bonds and swaps uh, have been mentioned today. These are uh, all benefiting uh, cont countries. But finally, we need to take full benefit of the partnership around partnerships and expertise around us. There is a strong ecosystem of IFIs, international and national actors. One key challenge and issue that the coalition is looking into how to make the best use of this uh, very complex ecosystem that we have around us globally, regionally and, and, and sometimes nationally. So I would like to mention that the coalition uh, will in the near future also uh, discuss, for example, with the credit rating agencies around these topics. It's really important to understand how the climate change in general affects our countries, but also in the context of, of the COVID uh, and what kind of reforms would be needed. But generally, one would expect that really is when, when there are issues, economic policy issues, crises, the really the key is to have strategy on how to get out of those situations and, and get back on the, on the track. Coalition uh, is about to release uh, a few reports in the in the in in the coming weeks, including in preparation for the COP in in two weeks' time. But but let me finish by just uh, saying a few few general remarks about where we are. I think it's important to understand that it, no matter what kind of a country we are talking about, that no country is ready in terms of mainstreaming. The work has in fact only started. Uh, we need to deeper our understanding and awareness about the actions required. We need to build expertise. That's, for example, why, why the coalition is launching a training program and trying to enhance the network of experts and, and, and utilization of research uh, that is undertaken by our partners and, and, and at the national level. But hopefully the pandemic is soon over and the focus put, could be put uh, more on reforms. This was also the main message from the last week's ministerial meeting. Uh, let me just uh, say a few words to, to fi finalize my, my interaction about this. Ministers gave a really strong momentum about uh, enhancing, uh, reforming economies uh, in the context of uh, uh, climate change challenges, and there's a lot of energy in the finance ministries to do this. There are more investments are put on, on expertise and tools. Coalition is turning out to be a focal point in this together with institutional partners. So there is strong appetite to move and, and we can add value. This is one reason why the number of membership has increased uh, recently. And the feedback from ministers is that the healthy key principles are, is bringing the framework, uh, the strategy that is needed. I think the, the minister of Philippines, uh, Philippines has been an active partner. Uh, example shows uh, well how, how this is done, a comprehensive approach. So we're looking forward to continuing these discussions uh, in, in Glasgow in a few weeks time. So I, I stop there. And, and thank greetings from Finland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Morin, for introducing the work of coalition in detail. Uh, we look forward to partnering um, with uh, member states in facilitating more and more membership to this coalition, which seems to understand, promote the dynamic relationship between climate change affecting the fiscal positions and in turn, fiscal initiatives affecting climate action. Um, our next panelist is Mr. Jeromin Zettelmeyer from the International Monetary Fund. Mr. Zettelmeyer, thank you for joining us from Washington, D.C. at such a late hour. We really appreciate your support for that. 
The increasing liquidity in global capital markets since May 2020, plus emergency lending by international financial institutions, including IMF, and the G20's DSSI, has probably averted the risk of a global debt crisis on the back of the pandemic. However, public debts have increased and there is a risk that the present spike in inflation could push central banks to increase interest rates, raising the cost of borrowing in turn. So what is your view about the ability of the current debt architecture to tackle a likely increase in episodes of debt insolvency? And for countries that remain solvent but face increasing debt servicing payments, as we heard from other speakers as well, how will they be able to afford investing in climate action and the sustainable development goals? Mr. Zettelmeyer, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hamza. So, so first, I, uh, I must say it's a great honor to be here, and I am very grateful to the Under Secretary General and, and to you and the team for, for inviting me. Uh, I'm also uh, grateful to you that you, you mentioned our emergency lending efforts. So we, we really tried very hard, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, to be as fast as, as, as we, we can. And it, it, to some extent, what we achieved was, was historic in the sense that we you know, pumped out emergency lending to about 80 countries within six weeks of the beginning of the pandemic. So to, to blame us for the fact that the SDR allocation was 12 months late is, is a bit unfair. Uh, we have pushed this from the start of the pandemic, but as you probably know, this is a huge endeavor. It's historically, it was done after the global financial crisis for the last time. It requires an 85% majority at the IMF board. And, you know, there's no secret that there's one country in our membership that has just about 15% of the votes and the government of that country at the time was not willing to support the SDR allocation and it took a change in government to finally make it happen. So that is the reason why your SDR allocation came 12 months uh, late. Uh, so let me make three points. Uh, the, the first is on debt risks. So the, the way we think about debt risks is, um, you know, put put them into two baskets, first of all. Um, one basket is the debt risks that are common to most low-income and emerging market economies, and indeed some advanced economies, and they are pandemic-related, and they are also related to debt vulnerabilities that were accumulated even before the pandemic. And then in the second basket, we have the you know, completely different and extraordinarily uh, complicated world of small climate vulnerable states that have a structural debt problem because of their you know, unique challenges. And, and so these are probably uh, two challenges that have to be dealt with separately. Uh, with respect to the first category, uh, the um, thing that I want you to, to uh, you know, take away is that since the beginning of the pandemic, so roughly since the spring of uh, 2020, debt risks have actually come down uh, on, on the whole in the sense that the propensity, the probability of a short-term crisis has decreased. And this was a result, like you said, of very easy financing, but also the fact that, you know, after a while, vaccines were being developed and we are now in a recovery. And so, you know, the, the risk of an immediate systemic debt crisis has actually gone down. Now, the bad news is that debt risk will remain high over a very substantial period, something like, you know, two to five years, the medium term. And the reason is that many countries will continue to have high deficits. It's just going to take time to do the fiscal adjustment, get the growth back. And, and, you know, in light of the fact that domestic financial buffers have very often been exhausted as a result of the pandemic, this is going to make many countries vulnerable to swings in external finance. Like you said, moderator, possibly result uh, uh, due to rising interest rates. And so we have a very difficult period uh, ahead of us. And so that brings me to your first question, you know, how much can we rely on, on debt restructuring frameworks? And 
The answer is it, it depends. So it depends on the type of claims and it depends on the creditor structure. We, we pretty much know how to uh, restructure bonds, right? So every restructuring is unpleasant. Uh, like the governor said, I, I agree with that. But but some restructurings are much easier than others, and we pretty much have figured out how to restructure international bonds in a relatively uh, short amount of time. The IMF uh, plays a role there by providing coordination, commitment, overcoming information problems, financing, and so forth. But what is much more difficult is to restructure debt when creditors are heterogeneous, and particularly when you have both private and official creditors, and particularly when you have official creditors that are Paris Club members and non-Paris Club members. So the Paris Club has done these things for, for many decades. It knows how to restructure. These things are quick. But bringing uh, the non-Paris Club members who are now the largest creditors together, that is very, very difficult. And so for that, we have the common framework. But as you said, moderator, the common framework is not available to all countries. It, it was uh, restricted to low-income countries. And even in that set of countries, it has been off to a rather slow start. Uh, so there have been, you know, so there has been some action. It is progressing. It is it is not uh, stuck, but it is very slow. Uh, and, and the result, the reason for that is actually pr pretty, pretty obvious, which is, you know, there is a deep reason why restructuring in, in settings that involves both Paris and non-Paris Club creditors has been so difficult. It has to do with deep structural reasons, in part relating to governance in the creditor countries. And these problems don't go away just because you make a political commitment that you're now going to do this framework. But the common framework and the political commitment that is behind it, of course, helps. And so we have to keep working on that. And that brings me to your second and, and my final point, which is for those countries that remain solvent but face increasing debt service payments, how can we afford investing in climate actions and the SDGs? So, you know, it's a really tough question. There's no easy answer. Uh, and, you know, part of the answer is that we, we might not, uh, it might not, uh, we might not um, get it done uh, to, to the full extent that we would like. So, um, the climate action and SDGs may indeed suffer setbacks. And of course, this has already happened massively with respect to poverty rates, for example, during the pandemic. Uh, but there are a couple of potential solutions. There's not one silver bullet. And so we are going to need sort of some patient mix, a bit on the lines of what um, the Secretary of Finance uh, of the Philippines was saying in his recorded message between domestic revenue mobilization creating good conditions for private sector-led investments so that you take some pressure off the public purse um, and, of course, external support. And, and the difficulty is how to get that external support mobilized at a time when there's a lot of donor and, and creditor fatigue because donors and creditors have already been taxed quite a lot during the pandemic. So how, how do we uh, create solutions that are sort of viable over the long term and, and the answer again, you know, we, we are going to have to uh, get creative. And, and so, you know, at the IMF, we are trying very hard <laughs> to, to be creative. Uh, one example is the idea to rechannel uh, some of these SDRs from countries that are not going to use them to a, a new trust facility, which we call the Resilience and Recovery Trust, which is uh, specifically targeted at vulnerable economies, so not necessarily low-income economies, also middle-income economies. Uh, and uh, this facility would uh, be used particularly for uh, climate action uh, and for pandemic recovery. It would be dispersed in the context of an IMF program, but, uh, and this is the additionality, with much longer repayment terms than we usually do, and also with lower interest rates uh, than we usually do. Not zero interest rates, but essentially passing on the very low SDR interest rates. So that is one possible answer, and that answer is sustainable. And then finally, on the issue of debt climate swaps that, that have been mentioned several times. So, so we, we are actually quite open uh, to them. In fact, we have been thinking about them. I personally have been thinking about them. I have written a note in the last few weeks or months with, with uh, a team of my colleagues, which should be issued quickly where we try to address this question, you know, when are they useful? Because they're not always useful. They cannot deal with deep debt crises 
for example, and uh, when are they useful and when they're useful, how can they be scaled up? And, and so the answer is complex. It has to do with uh, getting away from these sort of little by little project use and allowing more programmatic users, allowing use of um, funds in, in budgets rather than in, in projects. Uh, for that, you need to create proper monitoring structures, but also allowing uh, use in um, uh, uh, in in a way where the um, uh, terms are uh, conditional on the country achieving uh, performance indicators in area of climate or sustainable development. So, if, if you like, the agenda uh, on developing debt climate swaps cannot really be separated from the agenda of sustainable finance more broadly. Right? It's it's the same story. You need to create. KPIs, you need to create governance structures for these KPIs, you need to get the market used to them, right? It's the same agenda, it's just when, you, when you're talking about the climate swaps, you're not talking about just new money, but you're already to also talking about converting uh, existing debt. And of course, that gives you an extra kick in debt relief, which is important for, for many countries. So I think it's, uh, it's an important initiative, but it's a really complicated one. You have to do a lot of work uh, and so it's not going to give you sort of this um, the brilliant solution in the in the in the short term, but I think it's a it's a big part of the uh, solution in the in the medium. Let me stop here. Thank you, Mr. Meyer, for very detailed responses. Uh, I think this tension is always going to be there between the country's needs to invest from the fiscal side in particular for recovery nowadays and more generally towards SDGs and for climate action, and at the same time trying, trying to have debt sustainability there. I think there's a need to revisit some of the um, debt sustainability analysis framework to try and internalize that countries must be in needing to invest in SDGs and climate action, rather than immediately looking at saying and uh, addressing them, oh, they are facing now debt risks, or they're waiting to be downgraded and so on and so forth. So overall framework in which we think about these trade-offs uh, probably needs a much more closer inspection. Um, we have two more speakers and we are pretty much on time. So let's continue uh, with the next panelist, Mr. Asanali Dusembe. He's the director of the State Borrowing Department at the Ministry of Finance of Kazakhstan. Mr. Dusembe. As opposed to the conversation thus far regarding debt risk and limited fiscal space, in Kazakhstan, public debt is manageable, though it has increased somewhat by six percentage points to 27% of GDP in 2020. What are the main financing sources that Kazakhstan has tapped into for this purpose? And what prospects do you see for your country to tap into innovative financing sources such as we have been discussing, like green and sustainability bonds, and so on and so forth. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, excellencies, distinguished delegates. Sorry for that. At first, I would like to thank uh, ESCAP and uh, for invitation to join this important session and for giving the opportunity to speak out. As you know, the pandemic crisis has affected all countries, having negative impact on the fiscal sustainability of the world, advanced economies, as well as of all the less developed and developing countries. Most countries in the world are facing a revision of their budget deficits and consequently an increase in public debt. According to IMF, the average budget deficit to GDP ratio in 2021 reached 9.9% for advanced economies, 7.1% for emerging markets, and 5.2% for low-income developing countries. The IMF predicts that global public debt will approach 99% of global GDP by the end of 2021. In a pandemic environment, Kazakhstan public debt uh, increased by 5.5% to 29.2% of GDP at the, at the end of 2020. So with the budget deficit in the coming years, the need to attract new borrowing to cover it will remain and will lead to the variability of debt indicators, which requires uh, comprehensive management of debt and its risks. 
In the coming perspective, the annual volume of borrowing by the government to cover the budget needs will grow significantly and will amount to about 10, uh, 11 billion US dollars annually. The need to cover such volumes creates certain liquidity risks and requires the diversification of funding sources to find additional funds, including in the foreign capital market. Today, the domestic market of debt instruments in Kazakhstan, uh, like in many other developed countries, is the main source of, for financing the budget deficit. In order to increase liquidity and reduce the cost of borrowing in the domestic market, one of the main tasks is to increase the investor base with the attraction of foreign investors to the local market. So currently, the government, together with the National Bank, is implementing a set of measures. First, there is outgoing work for, uh, on the inclusion of government bonds in the global index of JP Morgan. In addition, starting next year, we plan to transfer government bonds trading to the T plus two settlement system, which will allow investors to manage their assets more predictably. If during the last year, the share of foreign investors in government bonds in the, of the Ministry of Finance was less than 0.1%, uh, today this figure has exceeded 3% and amounted to more than 800 million US dollars. One of the main factors of the inflow of foreign investors, in addition to the stable national currency and uh, positive expectations of investors, is the operating mechanism of the international system clear stream. Also, uh, we are working on established connection with the international clearing system EuroClear. The external capital market also remains an important source of budget financing. As a matter of priority, we are considering the options of issuing euro bonds in the national currency or in other soft currencies with a similar volatility to the national currency. In order to attract liquidity and diversify the portfolio of debt instruments, we are also interested in Islamic financing as well as borrowing instruments in the Asian financial markets. Furthermore, uh, cooperation with international financial organizations will continue taking into account the concessionality and long-term nature of financing provided by them. In general, uh, today in Kazakhstan, the issues of improving the efficiency of public debt, uh, of public finances and uh, debt management are priority ones. This year, within the task of the head of state, the government uh, is planning to adopt the concept of public finance management. It will cover the budget policy, issues of public debt management, as well as the formation and use of the national fund. The concept will be designed for the period of uh, 2030, and the implementation uh, of this concept will help reduce the budget deficit to 2% of GDP and the non-oil deficit to 5% by 2030. In overall, uh, we believe that this list of efforts uh, will allow to minimize liquidity risks and improve the sustainability of the state. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dissembe, for sharing the Kazakhstan experiences. Let's turn to our last uh, final panelist for today. Uh, before we do that, uh, please do post your questions uh, in the YouTube channel, uh, those who are watching or through the MS Teams network, those who have joined through that network. We've already received about six to eight questions, I think. Um, so just uh, let's get ready for the second round of conversation, taking questions from the floor. So our final panelist is Mr. Eric Gregorian, the former Minister of Environment of Armenia. Mr. Gregorian, earlier in this conversation, we discussed debt for climate swaps. You have been supporting the negotiations of Armenia with France on a debt for climate swap deal. Could you please share some experiences, some details on these negotiations? And how do you see debt for climate swaps as an instrument to simultaneously reduce debt vulnerability and increase financing for climate action projects? Mr. Gregorian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk today. And I strongly believe that now is a great momentum for that for climate swap. Um, and uh, here, 
is some misunderstanding between that for nature swap and that for climate swap having the same names actually but this philosophy beyond all these swaps are completely different so that for nature swap that coming from 80s it was you know part of reconstruction of problematic debt and uh, transferring some money for environment, mainly for biodiversity and forest uh, projects in South America and East Europe after. So it started from 80s and it took uh, several decades with several billion dollars. But uh, that for climate swap actually is a cooperation platform helping both sides to fulfill their obligations. Uh, when we are going to the climate reality, we see that the um, international community has failed to make a progress mobilizing 100 billion dollar annually from 2020 as it was uh, proposed and we see now there is a lack of platforms mechanism and capacity to mobilize and utilize this climate finance and that for climate swap actually may play a very important role now because Besides the climate risk and vulnerability of, uh, you know, the climate vulnerability of countries, now we have a COVID situation and we have a debt crisis now. And uh, essentially the instrument is helping both sides, the creditor country and debtor countries to fulfill their obligations because Besides the debt obligation, there are another obligation under Paris Agreement that creditor countries should take to support international develop, developing countries to fulfill their obligations and to implement their NDCs. You know, these uh, regulations under the Paris Agreement, it's the Climate Convention, the Annex to Countries have an obligation to support countries. So this is an option for countries to, to find a platform to start a negotiation to fulfill their own obligation. It's not one side uh, cooperation, it's a two side cooperation. And essentially this instrument uh, allows a creditor country to fulfill its commitments under the Paris Agreement and redirects those funds timely and efficiently now for climate adaptation and mitigation. Everyone knows that the financial resources spent now for adaptation and mitigation more useful than if you will do it after five or ten years. And also it uh, offers an opportunity to reduce countries' debt burden because of the COVID situation. We see what's going on. So uh, it's very important point that I wanted to mention that this debt for climate swap should be connected with the obligations under the Climate Convention and the Paris Agreement and action should be taken under the countries presented and this is that will give chance for the countries to be more transparent and the more monitoring tools to, to uh, follow the ongoing projects. Coming back to Armenia and France, I would like to inform that a situation in Armenia is especially urgent as we have uh, been ranked fourth most vulnerable country on climate change in Eastern Europe and Central Asia region. And we are already facing a climate uh, changes in Armenia with 1.3 degree increase of temperature and 9% decrease of precipitation that is affecting a lot of sectors, including water, agriculture, infrastructure, uh, forest, the biodiversity and all. So Armenia and France are signatories of Paris Agreement and under this agreement we are we were presenting our NDCs and in our NDC we have some um, figures what we are going to do till 2030 with the project and with the limitation of CO2 emissions that we are going to do. At the same time, uh, France with this NDC beside uh, reducing uh, carbon footprint, they have also an obligation to support developing countries and every year they are allocating some financial resources to that's going different channels. Of course, we have a Green Climate Fund and we have a global ecological facility, but it's not enough. It's not enough to find a way for the countries to uh, start 
allocate financial resources for climate adaptation and mitigation. So we started negotiations two years ago. We started with uh, our colleagues from the French uh, Ministry of Environment, and then we presented the projects that we want to do under our embassies. Then the World Bank supported us with the project, so it took around a year to develop the all documentation, project proposals and pipelines, and to have a concrete uh, project proposals, what we are going to do and how we are going to do it. But it's a main point here is not only negotiations between debtor and creditor country, but also to have a chance to go and to uh, register all these financial flows as a climate finance allocated by creditor countries because you should find the incentives also for your partner country. So in this case, if you have the clear projects under your NDCs, your NDCs are presented to Climate Convention Secretariat and it's uh, your obligation and you have a clear uh, project proposals for climate adaptation and mitigations after clarified with the OECD procedures um, like recognizing as an uh, official development assistance and uh, going through the climate convention secretariat procedures. So it's become a real uh, beneficial mechanism for both sides. It's not one way cooperation, it's a platform for both sides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gregorian. Um, very specific uh, details and experiences on debt for climate swaps. Um, our last speaker, Mr. Amar Patracharya, could not join us because of some technical difficulties. So we move on to the next segment. Um, before I come back to some speakers for their final thoughts, um, let's take questions. So we have received about eight questions so far. Uh, let's see how many we can cover. Let me start with the question that we have re re received from registered participants. This one is from Mr. Elliot Harris, who's a UN Chief Economist at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs based in New York. He's asking, what are the biggest obstacles to mobilizing and scaling up private flows for sustainable investments? And what can governments and financial regulators do to enable and support this? So maybe I request Mr. Zettelmeyer to take the first jab and then other panelists if they want to jump in. So I, I think the, the the biggest challenge is, um, you know, to ensure that uh, these uh, private flows are, um, you know, spent in ways that uh, can be justified uh, to these investors that ultimately have to uh, finance the the money. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are effectively two sets of issues. You know, one is the traditional set of the issues that has to do with, you know, private finance for any type of development, uh, which has to do with, you know, macro frameworks, governance, um, uh, property rights, uh, and and so forth, private development. Then there is a specific issue of how one does this in a green finance uh, context. So how one how one mobilizes what you know some call the the greenium, the cost difference between green finance and conventional finance. And of course that has a lot to do with enforceability, but but also with uh, a sense of whether um, you know by receiving the green funds. Uh, governments in, in particular will do things differently from what they would do with uh, conventional funds. And so here we are, we are only at the beginning uh, of, uh, of that. So this is a lot of what we've talked about, um, particularly the idea of linking financial terms, not necessarily to the uses of funds, but to the performance have to do with, uh, with this. And uh, let me stop. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, let me now take the question from the YouTube channel we received, and I think Mr. Moran will be in a good position to probably respond to that. Uh, this is from our colleague Sirinavas Tata, who's actually a director of social development division here at ASCAP. 
It's a very simple, very interesting question. In general, can we say that for the next few years, we should not worry about budget deficits and debt to GDP ratios and focus primarily on supporting a green and sustainable recovery? Is it doable, Mr. Moran? Well, the, this is a, this is a good question, and is, it is a question that is undergoing in Europe quite heavily right now as well. I would say that, uh, referring to what I said before, there is a need for a comprehensive approach. You need to understand what is going on, develop your strategies, and and uh, fiscal uh, stability is means everything when it comes to uh, financing your credit worth worthiness and 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 uh, credit ratings and and it, it all goes together uh, i think ev everybody have their sp fiscal space uh, and and in order to uh, acquire get financing you you, you need a, you need a strategy for so it's a country specific strategy and in some cases of course you need a need to combine your strategy with international partners and also in the the first question relating to that also i would just uh, add also to that uh, that really the complexity of the financial ecosystem globally is something uh, that is uh, 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 that is an issue i think how how you actually use these different institutions and the ecosystem to to mobilize finance and support your activities Thank you, Mr. Morin. There's a related question. Let me pose that. Uh, we may not need to respond to that unless Mr. Zettelmeyer or Mr. Gregorian wants to respond to that. It's a very similar question by Mr. Yogesh Sharma. He's asking, can we have a resolution to bound nations for specifying a certain percentage of GDP devoted to recovering from climate change? It's on similar lines, essentially allocating resources primarily for climate change. So I think we'll stick to Mr. Morin's observations for that, or anybody wants to add something Mr. Morin said? I think let's move on because we have six more questions here. Yeah. Let me now turn to a question from, this one I think is for Mr. Gregorian, I think. Let's start with him. Uh, for Mr. Chin Chuan Wee, Mermaid, Mermaid Ventures Private Limited, he's a director there uh, from Singapore. The question is, please share your thoughts on the potential of blended finance for sustainable, develop, for sustainable development. So Mr. Gogurian, you want to take the first jab? Maybe Mr. Zettelmeyer wants to respond to that. Potential of blended finance. Um, yeah, I, I will try with uh, several words, just the, the mechanism that we worked on uh, primarily focused on uh, bilateral debt and the public debt. But of course, it's an opportunity also to um, add uh, other uh, partners and players like from uh, climate funds because a green climate fund itself developing their own debt for climate swap mechanism and they were presenting us how they are going to do it. Uh, I, I have some information, but uh, Mr. Zettelmeyer can add that IMF is going to uh, bring something to Glasgow to show about that for climate swap. But yes, there is an option uh, uh, besides uh, bilateral cooperation from the public funds to add the climate funds and private uh, players also. Once we will have some uh, success in Glasgow related to Article 6 about international trade mitigation outcomes, it will bring a lot of more interest from private sectors on climate financing. Yeah, I, I mean, basically, I think this is a fertile area where, you know, probably MDVs, possibly the IMF, are going to have a role for some time, but you want the private sector to have an increasing role. And, you know, there, there are ways to to combine this. Um, so you can have, uh, for example, officially financed buybacks of conventional debt um, that, you know, retire uh, conventional debt and, and so sort of accelerate the 
transition to sustainable finance forms, you could uh, possibly have uh, MDBs finance some kind of credit enhancement that that lowers the sovereign risk uh, embedded uh, in the new uh, sustainable instruments. And of course, you know, most importantly, you can have uh, the um, you know both NGOs, but also multilateral development banks, the World Bank, and, and so forth, uh, have a strong role in both designing and and then monitoring uh, performance frameworks that then allow uh, countries uh, to issue debt that would be attractive to private investors. Uh, particularly, you know, things like institutional investors like pension funds that follow uh, certain mandates um, on investing a share in sustainable finance. So this goes back to uh, the point that uh, Elliot Harris um, made. Thank you, Mr. Zettelmeyer. I see the Honorable Prime Minister uh, from Cook Island is still with us. So, Excellency, feel free to jump in if you have want to share further insights. Let me read this next question, actually, which is very broad nature. Any um, uh, panelist and speaker can respond to that. This is from Dr. Shruti Kashyap. She's an associate professor at Uppsala University from Sweden. Uh, she's asking, it would be curious to learn about insights and synergies as relevant to risk recognition and mitigation in the context of sustainable resilience post-pandemic. So how can we harness better debt financing and risk diversifications from lessons learned over the past two years. So who is the expert on risk diversification <coughs> influencing debt financing options? Uh, perhaps I can um, Excellency. provide some comment. Yeah, I think uh, one of the words that was used last year in the pandemic was unprecedented. And I think for us looking to the future, uh, looking to to recover, uh, it take it will take unprecedented measures. Uh, so, in terms of managing uh, risk, in terms of how we recognise risk, uh, it, and I mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, countries' debt portfolios, I think the debt conference that we are looking to host next year is a, is a great opportunity to put forward some initiatives uh, that are not normal economic based thinking. So when I mentioned earlier about uh, debt that countries have, uh, the amount of money that my operating budget puts towards green initiatives, towards mitigation and adaptation measures, when I put a climate lens over my spending, it's about 15% of our annual budget goes on to adaptation and resilience building measures uh, and also mitigation measures for renewable energy and, and so forth. Now, some of this is funded, well, a significant proportion of this is funded through debt. If we could take that debt and recognize it separately from our national debt, put it into a, some form of financial instrument uh, that doesn't do away with it, but recognizes it separately, and then find a way to address that debt. Debt is a commodity. Uh, so there are ways that people can utilize this debt uh, in a way throughout the financial world. Uh, and then... As I mentioned earlier, for us, the focus would be to reduce the debt servicing um, amount, which for us pre-COVID was about 5% of our government revenues. Today, that would exceed over 20%. So it's a significant jump uh, and a significant amount that's taken uh, out of our, our budget. We need to find a way to manage that for the period of time that it will allow us to recover and grow our economy to reduce that, that proportion of uh, debt servicing uh, against our government revenues. Um, and some of the things that we will be proposing uh, may not be bankable, may not be financially viable. Uh, but as I said earlier, we have to look at measures and means that are unprecedented over a very long period of time to see ourselves through uh, this period. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Since I have you on the floor, actually, this next question is probably directly addressed to you. Um, this is from Mr. Ronnie Tupoe, uh, Nayan Atoni Enclave, based in uh, Timor-Leste. They're asking, how can the innovative financing instruments for sustainable development support a small country? And what are its potential in the long term? 
I think in your remarks you alluded to um, longer term maturity instruments. So if I can request you to share further thoughts. Yeah, certainly. Um, with the COP26 meeting due in the next week or so, uh, again, the, uh, the comments have been turning towards the commitment of $100 billion uh, by countries to assist uh, those at risk of the effects of climate change. Now, when we look at it in terms of the global economy, that represents about 0.1% of the global economy, so a modest amount uh, to help. Um, when I compare what we spend as our GDP amount, uh, I, I would gladly contribute 0.1% uh, of our GDP towards uh, our contribution to the $100 billion uh, a year. But I think the important thing to note is that climate change effects uh, have taken place over decades, number of years. The impacts will be felt for decades uh, over a number of years. So the financing aspects to address climate and uh, building resilience cannot be measured in terms of the normal banking terms that we have of 10 to 20 years, uh, but they must be looked at over the longer periods. As I said, the amortizing of, of debt uh, over 50 to 100 years needs to be considered as uh, a means for small countries, small island states, uh, to be able to get the maximum benefit. Uh, taking care of debt servicing amounts provides leverage to be able to meet current debt, to be able to take out more debt as we need to uh, for development finance and also for uh, building resilience uh, moving forward. So these are, as I said, some of the things they may, uh, for smaller countries, have a, uh, they may be small initiatives, but they have far reaching greater impacts uh, for us. Um, yeah, so those are my comments on that. Thank you very much, Excellency. Uh, I have one or more, two more questions, but I think in the interest of time, uh, my colleagues remind me, I need to have this, we have this uh, one last uh, coming back to our speakers who are still with us um, before we have a concluding remarks from our executive secretary. So this is a simple one. I want to ask the same question to all speakers that are here and if you respond in 30 seconds to one minute max. Um, so basically imagine that your message is going to be tomorrow's headline. So in less than a minute, could you, each of you, please tell us what is one innovative policy solution that you that you would like to see adopted in your country or in our region that can accelerate financing for SDGs and climate action? So Excellency, let's have a headline news from you first, and then we move on to the next speakers. Thank you. I think the establishment of a, a special financial instrument that focuses on debt servicing to allow us to leverage more debt that we require at this time to progress our development initiatives to address the debt issues that we have built up uh, in uh, overcoming COVID uh, and also to look longer term at building resilience. Uh, the infrastructure needs and the costs uh, far exceed what we are able to uh, utilize domestically from our own revenues. So uh, debt is the way to go, uh, but to manage that debt rather than just looking at the ceiling, let's look at the ability to repay it as a focus. Excellent. So since you remarked on the uh, ability to continue to take debt in a sustainable manner, let me ask Mr. Zettelmeyer to share his 30 second headline news. The headline news is IMF readies, I don't know, 40, 50 billion uh, resilience and sustainability trust to support a large group of vulnerable states through low cost finance uh, targeted at tackling climate problems. Good, clear, precise. Mr. Morin, your thoughts, please. Your fundamental message. I think the key message is that we are dealing with system, systemic change here and you will make it to the headlines, finance ministries will make it to the he headlines if they ignore this and, and climate change will be with us for a long time, uh, it's not going to go away. So investing on expertise, investing on know-how, that's really crucial, that would be my, my message. Thank you Mr. Moran. 
Mr. Gregorian, you have the last word for today. The floor is yours. It will be the simple one. So that's for climate for this solution and alternative platform for leveraging finance and act now. I'm not surprised. Thank you very much. Very precise. Um, OK. We are pretty much spot on time, which is great. Now, Excellencies, distinguished panelists, this concludes our conversation, our panel discussion today. I hope you benefited, enjoyed. Thank you very much, the participants, for very insightful remarks. Let me now invite ASCAP's Executive Secretary, Ibu Amida, to provide her closing remarks. Ibu Amida, the floor is yours, madam. Thank you very much, uh, Hamza, for uh, moderating the session and also facilitating the discussion, and uh, especially uh, our appreciation and thanks to all panelists, to all eminent panelists for the important insight perspectives. Uh, I think uh, starting with speakers from several countries that have shared their direct experience in uh, trying to manage the situation, especially the fiscal challenges, as well as at the same time mitigating the impact of COVID, the health related impact, the so social uh, as well as economic impact and the needs yeah, to finance uh, all uh, the, the measures. And at the same time also we see uh, the, the impact uh, not only contraction to the economy, but at the same time, revenue drops significantly. In some instances, for example, as shared by the minister from Maldives, as well as uh, from central government Sri Lanka, revenue can drop significantly in, in, in one year. Yeah? The, the case of, for example, last year, it dropped significantly, again, because of the economy relied uh, very heavily on the sector, in this case, tourism and other related sectors that was uh, hit hardest by the pandemic. But at the same time, at the same time, uh, the expenditure needs to be uh, not only maintained, yeah, but actually uh, government needs uh, to provide this, uh, this, this uh, stimulus packages. Yeah. So therefore it's unavoidable that many countries then uh, uh, see yeah, their their debt, uh, their debt, the budget deficit uh, increase also significantly, and to the point for some countries, uh, especially in our region, several countries, uh, to the point of uh, debt distress. Yeah. So therefore, uh, we also learn that there are uh, several initiative and momentum have taken place. Uh, 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 including, yeah, we learn from uh, the coalition of the Minister of Finance, the Global Coalition of Minister of Finance, that uh, there is strong appetite for reforms, which is very good, very welcome. Uh, transition strategies, as well as to support the decarbonization efforts, yeah, uh, to 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 also realize uh, the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. But of course. This kind of effort is a more medium to long term effort, where at the same time there is a very pressing, pressing needs, yeah, which is immediate, <laughs> immediate, very short term that needs also uh, to be addressed. Uh, another point that we 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 heard from the conversation, from the discussion, and also from from the insight from the eminent speakers, is that debt risk will remain high, at least in the medium term. Yeah, uh, so therefore, again, uh, the challenge is how to manage the debt situation, but at the same time also yeah, going to the medium long term, how to reduce this uh, debt, uh, debt level. Uh, at this, uh, as well as the need for climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, as well as to build resilience. Uh, uh, many countries, yeah, including uh, the Pacific Island countries, this very urgent needs yeah, to build re resilience. And for that, you need, of course, 
uh, the support of uh, additional funding, collaboration, uh, and uh, resources, as well as uh, capacities yeah, to support that. And last but not least is uh, the ID, uh, but it already uh, been uh, started or implemented. Uh, for example, a um, speaker from Armenia shared the experience, direct experience, uh, with which uh, already started uh, by Armenia uh, and, and, and in collaboration with France, which is uh, the Dev for Climate Swap. Yeah? I think uh, this idea is still new. Again, yeah, many of us, uh, again, the, the more the non-specialists, yeah, I mean, is uh, more familiar with the earlier ID of uh, Dev for Nature Swap, in which the speaker for Ar Armenia also uh, clearly, uh, uh, you know, um, informed or reminded us that the Dev for Climate Swap is, is, is something different, totally different, yeah? Whereas um, many of us still think, yeah, whether the Dev for Climate Swap is it the same with the earlier ideas of Dev for Nature Swap in the 1980s, uh, 1980s, 1990s, yeah, in which again we understand, yeah, we know that the earlier one uh, had uh, many, many also uh, challenges, it's not that successful, yeah. So, therefore, uh, if this is indeed a potential solution, uh, the death for climate swap, and uh, I think it is quite interesting in, in, in the sense that uh, this. This needs the commitment of both sides, the debtor and creditor, yeah, to fulfill their obligations. It's not a one-way street. To fulfill their obligations uh, with regard to the Paris Climate Agreement and to implement the NDCs. Yeah. But of course, a lot of homework, yeah, a lot of details yeah, that needs to be prepared in this regard. Uh, so therefore, I think going forward, if this is in, indeed one of the potential solutions, then the need of also uh, developing some sort of framework, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, one or, you know, uh, any country can do it, yeah, bilaterally, but it would be good, yeah, if we want to scale up this initiative, the potential of this initiative, then you need also uh, to be able to develop the kind of framework, yeah? the principles, uh, the guiding principles, the framework and so on for the parties, or the potential countries that would like to enter to this uh, new initiative, then they, they, they can proceed, yeah? Uh, 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 I mean, um, learning from, from uh, the ones that have been implemented. So with that, so I apologize if, uh, of course, I cannot do justice here for all the, the many uh, great insights, perspective from all the speakers, yeah, if I cannot, uh, you know, summarize it all, but uh, colleagues here will will summarize uh, in, in, in due time and also share with uh, all of you. Again, thank you very much for this very interesting, very insightful, and very useful uh, conversation. Thank you very much and over to you, Hamza. Thank you, Ibu Amida. Um, with this, I think the regional conversation is concluded. All of you stay safe and have a great productive rest of the day. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, before you leave, I would like to remind you that an online evaluation form is available in the chat. Please take a few minutes to complete it. This is very important for us to improve the quality of future events. Thank you very much for your attention.